Hello friends and welcome to the ninth installment in this calm reading of The Secret Garden. Tonight I will be reading for you chapter 22, When the Sun Went Down, and chapter 23, Magic. Find yourself a place where you can safely relax and peacefully listen to these chapters. Chapter 22 When the Sun Went Down When his head was out of sight, Colin turned to Mary. Go and meet him, he said, and Mary flew across the grass to the door under the ivy. Dickon was watching him with sharp eyes. There were scarlet spots on his cheeks, and he looked amazing, but he showed no signs of falling. I can stand, he said, and his head was still held up, and he said it quite grandly. I told thee thou could, as soon as thou stopped being afraid, answered Dickon, and thou stopped. Yes, I've stopped, said Colin. Then, suddenly, he remembered something Mary had said. Are you making magic? he asked sharply. Dickon's curly mouth spread in a cheerful grin. Thou's doing magic thyself, he said. It's the same magic as made these ere work out of the earth. And he touched with his thick boot a clump of crocuses in the grass. Colin looked down at them. Aye, he said slowly, there could not be bigger magic than that there. There could not be. He drew himself up straighter than ever. I'm going to walk to that tree, he said pointing to one a few feet away from him. I'm going to be standing when Weatherstaff comes here. I can rest against the tree if I like. When I want to sit down, I will sit down, but not before. Bring a rug from the chair. He walked to the tree, and though Dickon held his arm, he was wonderfully steady. When he stood against the tree trunk, it was not too plain that he supported himself against it. And he still held himself so straight that he looked tall. When Ben Weatherstaff came through the door in the wall, he saw him standing there, and he heard Mary muttering something under her breath. What art saying? he asked rather testily, because he did not want his attention distracted from the long, thin, straight boy figure and proud face. But she did not tell him. What she was saying was this. You can do it. You can do it. I told you you could. You can do it. You can do it. You can. She was saying it to Colin, because she wanted to make magic and keep him on his feet, looking like that. She could not bear that he should give in before Ben Weatherstaff. He did not give in. She was uplifted by a sudden feeling that he looked quite beautiful in spite of his thinness. He fixed his eyes on Ben Weatherstaff in his funny, imperious way. Look at me, he commanded. Look at me all over. Am I a hunchback? Have I got crooked legs? Ben Weatherstaff had not quite got over his emotion, but he had recovered a little and answered almost in his usual way. Not tha, he said, now to the sort. What's thou been doing with thyself? Hiding out of sight and letting folk think thou was cripple and half-witted. Half-witted, said Colin angrily. Who thought that? Lots of fools, said Ben. The world's full of jackasses, brain, and they never brain out but lies. What did thou shut thyself up for? 
Everyone thought I was going to die, said Colin shortly. I am not. And he said it with such decision. Ben Weatherstaff looked him over, up and down, down and up. Thou die, he said with dry exultation. Now to the sort. Thou hast got too much pluck in thee. When I see thee, put thy legs on the ground. In such a hurry, I note thou was all right. Sit thee down on the rock a bit, young master, and give me thy orders. And there was a queer mixture of crabbed tenderness and shrewd understanding in his manner. Mary had poured out speech as rapidly as she could as they had come down the long walk. The chief thing to be remembered, she had told him, was that Colin was getting well. Getting well. The garden was doing it. No one must let him remember about having humps and dying. The Raja condescended to seat himself on a rug under the tree. What work do you do in the gardens, brother staff? he inquired. Anything I'm told to do, answered old Ben. I'm kept on by favor, because she liked me. She, said Colin. The mother, answered Ben Weatherstaff. My mother, said Colin, and he looked about him quietly. This was her garden, wasn't it? Aye, it was that, and Ben Weatherstaff looked about him too. She were main fond of it. It is my garden now. I am fond of it. I shall come here every day, announced Colin. But it is to be a secret. My orders are that no one is to know that we come here. Dickon and my cousin have worked and made it come alive. I shall send for you sometimes to help. But you must come when no one can see you. Ben Weatherstaff's face twisted itself in a dry old smile. I've come here before when no one saw me, he said. What? exclaimed Colin. When? The last time I was here, rubbing his chin and looking round, was about two years ago. But no one has been in it for ten years, cried Colin. There was no door. I'm no one said old Ben dryly. And I didn't come through the door. I came over the wall. The rheumatics held me back the last two years. That come and did a bit of pronin, cried Dickon. I couldn't make out how it had been done. She was so fond of it, she was, said Ben Weatherstaff slowly. And she was such a pretty young thing. She says to me once, Pen, says she, laughing, if ever I'm ill or if I go away, you must take care of my roses. When she did go away, the orders was no one was ever to come nigh. But I come, with grumpy obstinacy. Over the wall I come until the rheumatic stopped me, and I did a bit of work once a year. She'd gave her order first. It wouldn't have been as weak as it is if thou hadn't done it, said Dickon. I did wonder. I'm glad you did it, Weatherstaff, said Colin. You'll know how to keep the secret. I, I know, sir, answered Ben. And it'll be easier for a man with rheumatics to come in at the door. On the grass near the tree, Mary had dropped her trowel. Colin stretched out his hand and took it up. An odd expression came into his face, and he began to scratch at the earth. His thin hand was weak enough, but presently, as they watched him, Mary, with quite breathless interest, he drove the end of the trowel into the soil and turned the sum over. You can do it! You can do it! said Mary to herself. I tell you, you can. Dickens' round eyes were full of eager curiousness, but he said not a word. 
Ben Weatherstaff looked on with interested face. Colin persevered. After he had turned a few trowelfuls of soil, he spoke exultantly to Dickon in his best Yorkshire. Thou said, as thou'd have me walkin' about here same as other folk. And thou said, thou'd have me diggin'. I thought thou was just lean to please me. This is only the first day, and I've walked, and here I am diggin'. Ben Weatherstaff's mouth fell open again when he heard him, but he ended by chuckling. Eh, hey, he said, thou sounds as if thou got wits enow. Thou art a Yorkshire lad for sure, and thou art diggin' too. How thou like to plant a bit or something? I can get thee a rose in a pot. Go and get it, said Colin, digging excitedly. Quick, quick. It was done quickly enough indeed. Ben Weatherstaff went his way, forgetting rheumatics. Dickon took a spade and dug the hole deeper and wider than a new digger with thin white hands could make it. Mary slipped out to run and bring back a watering can. When Dickon had deepened the hole, Colin went on turning the soft earth over and over. He looked up at the sky, flushed and glowing with the strangely new exercise, slight as it was. I want to do it before the sun goes quite, quite down, he said. Mary thought that perhaps the sun held back a few minutes just on purpose. Ben Weatherstaff brought the rose in its pot from the greenhouse. He hobbled over the grass as fast as he could. He had begun to be excited, too. He knelt down by the hole and broke the pot from the mold. Here, lad, he said, handing the plant to Colin. Set it in the earth thy cell, same as the king does when he goes to a new place. The thin white hands shook a little, and Colin's flush grew deeper as he set the rose in the mount, and held it while old Ben made firm the earth. It was filled in and pressed down and made steady. Mary was leaning forward on her hands and knees. Soot had flown down and marched forward to see what was being done. Nut and Shell chattered about it from a cherry tree. It's planted, said Colin at last, and the sun is only slipping over the edge. Help me up, Dickon. I want to be standing when it goes. That's part of the magic. And Dickon helped him, and the magic, or whatever it was, so gave him strength, that when the sun did slip over the edge and end the strange lovely afternoon for them there, he actually stood on his two feet, laughing. Chapter 23 Magic Dr. Craven had been waiting some time at the house when they returned to it. He had indeed begun to wonder if it might not be wise to send someone out to explore the garden paths. When Colin was brought back to his room, the poor man looked him over seriously. You should not have stayed so long, he said. You must not overexert yourself. I am not tired at all, said Colin. It has made me well. Tomorrow I am going out in the morning as well as in the afternoon. I am not sure that I can allow it, answered Dr. Craven. I am afraid it would not be wise. It would not be wise to try to stop me, said Colin quite seriously. I am going. Even Mary had found out that one of Colin's chief peculiarities was that he did not know in the least what a rude little brute he was with his way of ordering people about. He had lived on a sort of desert island all his life, and, as he had been the king of it, he had made his own manners and had had no one to compare himself with. 
Mary had indeed been rather like him herself, and since she had been at Misselthwaite had gradually discovered that her own manners had not been of the kind which is usual or popular. Having made this discovery, she naturally thought it of enough interest to communicate to Colin. So she sat and looked at him curiously for a few minutes after Dr. Craven had gone. She wanted to make him ask her why she was doing it, and of course she did. What are you looking at me for? he said. I'm thinking that I'm rather sorry for Dr. Craven. So am I said Colin calmly, but not without an air of some satisfaction. He won't get Misselthwaite at all now. I'm not going to die. I'm sorry for him because of that, of course, said Mary. But I was thinking just then that it must have been very horrid to have had to be polite for ten years, to a boy who was always rude. I would never have done it. Am I rude? Colin inquired undisturbedly. If you had been his own boy, and he had been a slapping sort of man, said Mary, he would have slapped you. But he daren't, said Colin. No, he daren't, answered Mistress Mary, thinking the thing out quite without prejudice. Nobody ever dared to do anything you didn't like because you were going to die, and things like that. You were such a poor thing. But, announced Colin stubbornly, I am not going to be a poor thing. I won't let people think I'm one. I stood on my feet this afternoon. It is always having your own way that has made you so queer, Mary went on, thinking aloud. Colin turned his head, frowning. Am I queer? he demanded. Yes, answered Mary. Very. But you needn't be cross, she added impartially, because so am I queer, and so is Ben Weatherstaff. But I am not as queer as I was before I began to like people, and before I found the garden. I don't want to be queer, said Colin. I'm not going to be, and he frowned again with determination. He was a very proud boy. He lay thinking for a while, and then Mary saw his beautiful smile begin and gradually changed his whole face. I shall stop being queer, he said. If I go every day to the garden, there is magic in there, good magic, you know, Mary. I am sure there is. So am I, said Mary. Even if it isn't real magic, Colin said, we can pretend it is. Something is there. Something. It's magic, said Mary, but not black. It's as white as snow. They always called it magic, and indeed it seemed like it in the months that followed. The wonderful months. The radiant months the amazing ones. Oh, the things which happened in that garden. If you have never had a garden, you cannot understand. And if you have had a garden, you will know that it would take a whole book to describe all that came to pass there. At first it seemed that green things would never cease pushing their way through the earth, in the grass, in the beds, even in the crevices of the walls. When the green things began to show buds, and the buds began to unfurl and show color, every shade of blue, every shade of purple, every tint and hue of crimson. In its happy days, flowers had been tucked away into every inch and hole and corner. Ben Weatherstaff had seen it done, and had himself scraped out mortar from between the bricks of the wall, and made pockets of earth for lovely clinging things to grow on. Iris and white lilies rose out of the grass in sheaves, 
and the green alcoves filled themselves with amazing armies of the blue and white flower lances of tall delphiniums, or columbines, or campanulas. She was main fond of them, she was, Ben Weatherstuff said. She liked them things, as was Alice pointing up to the blue sky. She used to tell. Not that she was one of them, as looked down on the earth, not her. She just loved it. But she said, as the blue sky always looked so joyful. The seeds Dickon and Mary had planted grew as if fairies had tended them. Satiny poppies of all tints danced in the breeze by the score. Gaily defying flowers which had lived in the garden for years, and which it might be confessed seemed rather to wonder how such new people had got there. And the roses, the roses, rising out of the grass, tangled round the sundial, wreathing the tree trunks and hanging from their branches, climbing up the walls and spreading over them with long garlands falling in cascades. They came alive day by day, hour by hour, fair fresh leaves and buds, and buds, tiny at first, but swelling and working magic, until they burst and uncurled into cups of scent, delicately spilling themselves over the brims, and filling the garden air. Colin saw it all, watching each change as it took place. Every morning he was brought out, and every hour of each day, when it didn't rain, he spent in the garden. Even grey days pleased him. He would lie on the grass, watching things growing, he said. If you watched long enough, he declared, you could see buds unsheath themselves. Also you could make the acquaintance of strange busy insect things running about on various unknown but evidently serious errands. Sometimes carrying tiny scraps of straw or feather or food or climbing blades of grass, as if they were trees from whose tops one could look out to explore the country. A mole, throwing up its mound at the end of its burrow, and making its way out at last with the long-nailed paws, which looked so like elfish hands, had absorbed him one whole morning. Ants' ways, beetles' ways, bees' ways, Frogs' ways, birds' ways, plants' ways, gave him a new world to explore, and when Dickon revealed them all and added foxes' ways, otters' ways, ferrets' ways, squirrels' ways, and trouts' and water rats' and badgers' ways, there was no end to the things to talk about and think over. And this was not the half of the magic. The fact that he had really once stood on his feet had set Colin thinking tremendously, and when Mary told him of the spell she had worked, he was excited and approved of it greatly. He talked of it constantly. Of course there must be lots of magic in the world, he said wisely one day. But people don't know what it is like or how to make it. Perhaps the beginning is just to say nice things are going to happen until you make them happen. I am going to try and experiment. The next morning, when they went to the secret garden, he sent at once for Ben Weatherstaff. Ben came as quickly as he could and found the Raja standing on his feet under a tree and looking very grand but also very beautifully smiling. Good morning, Ben Weatherstaff, he said. I want you and Dickon and Miss Mary to stand in a row and listen to me, because I am going to tell you something very important. Aye, aye, sir, answered Ben Weatherstaff, touching his forehead. One of the long-concealed charms of Ben Weatherstaff was that in his boyhood he had once run away to sea and had made voyages, so he could reply 
like a sailor. I'm going to try a scientific experiment, explained the Raja. When I grow up, I'm going to make great scientific discoveries, and I'm going to begin now with this experiment. Aye, aye, sir, said Ben Weatherstaff promptly, though this was the first time he had heard of great scientific discoveries. It was the first time Mary had heard of them either, but even at this stage she had begun to realize that, queer as he was, Colin had read about a great many singular things, and was somehow a very convincing sort of boy. When he held up his head and fixed his strange eyes on you, it seemed as if you believed him almost in spite of yourself, though he was only ten years old, going on eleven. At this moment he was especially convincing, because he suddenly felt the fascination of actually making a sort of speech, like a grown-up person. The great scientific discoveries I'm going to make, he went on, will be about magic. Magic is a great thing, and scarcely anyone knows anything about it, except a few people in old books. And Mary a little, because she was born in India, where there are fakirs. I believe Dickon knows some magic, but perhaps he doesn't know he knows it. He charms animals and people. I would never have let him come to see me if he had not been an animal charmer. Which is a boy charmer, too, because a boy is an animal. I am sure there is magic in everything, only we have not sense enough to get hold of it and make it do things for us. Like electricity, and horses, and steam. This sounded so imposing that Ben Weatherstaff became quite excited and really could not keep still. Aye, aye, sir, he said, and he began to stand up quite straight. When Mary found this garden, it looked quite dead. The orator proceeded. Then something began pushing things up, out of the earth, out of the soil, and making things out of nothing. One day things weren't there, and another they were. I had never watched things before, and it made me feel very curious. Scientific people are always curious, and I'm going to be scientific. I keep saying to myself, what is it? What is it? It's something. It can't be nothing. I don't know its name, so I call it magic. I have never seen the sun rise, but Mary and Dickon have, and from what they tell me, I am sure that is magic too. Sometimes, since I've been in the garden, I've looked up through the trees at the sky, and I have had a strange feeling of being happy, as if something were pushing and drawing in my chest and making me breathe fast. Magic is always pushing and drawing and making things out of nothing. Everything is made out of magic. Leaves and trees, flowers and birds, badgers and foxes, squirrels and people. So it must be all around us, in this garden, in all the places. The magic in this garden has made me stand up and know I'm going to live to be a man. I am going to make the scientific experiment of trying to get some and put it in myself and make it push and draw me and make me stronger. I don't know how to do it, but I think that if you keep thinking about it and calling it, perhaps it will come. Perhaps that is the first baby way to get it. When I was going to try to stand that first time, Mary kept saying to herself as fast as she could, You can do it, you can do it. And I did. I had to try myself at the same time, of course, but her magic helped me. And so did Dickens. Every morning and evening, and as often in the daytime as I can remember, I am going to say, Magic is in me. Magic is making me well. 
I'm going to be as strong as Dickon, as strong as Dickon. And you must all do it too. That is my experiment. Will you help, Ben Weatherstaff? Aye, aye, sir, said Ben Weatherstaff. Aye, aye. If you keep doing it every day, as regularly as soldiers go through drill, we shall see what will happen and find out if the experiment succeeds. You learn things by saying them over and over, and thinking about them until they stay in your mind forever. And I think it will be the same with magic. If you keep calling it to come to you and help you, it will get to be part of you, and it will stay and do things. I once heard an officer in India tell my mother that there were fakirs who said words over and over thousands of times, said Mary. I've heard Jem Fiddleworth's wife say the same thing over thousands of times, calling Jem a drunk brute, said Ben Weatherstaff dryly. Some are dull as come at that, sure enough. He gave her a good hiding and went to the blue lion and got as drunk as a lord. Colin drew his brows together and thought a few minutes. Then he cheered up. Well, he said, you see something did come of it. She used the wrong magic until she made him beat her. If she used the right magic and had said something nice, perhaps he wouldn't have got as drunk as a lord. And perhaps, perhaps he might have bought her a new bonnet. Ben Weatherstaff chuckled, and there was shrewd admiration in his little old eyes. Thou'rt a clever lad, as well as a straight-legged one, Mr. Colin. Next time I see Bess Fiddleworth, I'll give her a bit of a hint of what magic will do for her. She'd be rare and pleased if the scientific experiment worked. And so a gem. Dickon had stood listening to the lecture his round eyes shining with curious delight. Nut and Shell were on his shoulders, and he held a long-eared white rabbit in his arm, and stroked and stroked it softly, while it laid its ears along its back, and enjoyed itself. Do you think the experiment will work? Colin asked him, wondering what he was thinking. He so often wondered what Dickon was thinking when he saw him looking at him or at one of his creatures, with his happy white smile. He smiled now, and his smile was wider than usual. Aye, he answered, that I do. It'll work same as the seeds do when the sun shines on them. It'll work for sure. Shall us begin it now? Colin was delighted, and so was Mary. Fired by recollections of fakirs and devotees in illustrations, Colin suggested that they should all sit cross-legged under the tree, which made a canopy. It will be like sitting in a sort of temple, said Colin. I'm rather tired and want to sit down. Eh, said Dickon, thou mustn't begin by saying thou art tired. Thou might spoil the magic. Colin turned and looked at him, into his innocent round eyes. That's true, he said slowly. I must only think of the magic. It all seemed most majestic and mysterious when they sat down in their circle. Ben Weatherstaff felt as if he had somehow been led into appearing at a prayer meeting. Ordinarily, he was very fixed in being what he called agon prayer meetings. But this, being the Rajah's affair, he did not resent it, and was indeed inclined to be gratified at being called upon to assist. Mistress Mary felt solemnly enraptured. Dickon held his rabbit in his arm, and perhaps he made some charmer's signal no one heard. For when he sat down, cross-legged like the rest. The crow, the fox, the squirrels, and the lambs slowly drew near, and made part of the circle, settling each into a place of rest, as if of their own desire. The creatures have come, said Colin gravely. 
They want to help us. Colin really looked quite beautiful, Mary thought. He held his head high, as if he felt like a sort of priest, and his strange eyes had a wonderful look in them. The light shone on him through the tree canopy. Now we will begin, he said. Shall we sway backward and forward, Mary, as if we were dervishes? I cannot do swaying backward and forward, said Ben Weatherstaff. I've got the rheumatics. The magic will take them away, said Colin in a high priest tone. But we won't sway until it has done it. We will only chant. I cannot do no chanting, said Ben Weatherstaff a trifle testily. They turned me out of the church choir the only time I ever tried it. No one smiled. They were all too much in earnest. Colin's face was not even crossed by a shadow. He was thinking only of the magic. Then I will chant, he said, and he began looking like a strange boy spirit. The sun is shining. The sun is shining. That is the magic. The flowers are growing. The roots are stirring. That is the magic. Being alive is the magic. Being strong is the magic. The magic is in me. The magic is in me. It is in me. It is in me. It's in every one of us. It's in Ben Weatherstaff's back. Magic. Magic. Come and help. He said it a great many times. Not a thousand times, but quite a goodly number. Mary listened entranced. She felt as if it were at once queer and beautiful, and she wanted him to go on and on. Ben Weatherstaff began to feel soothed into a sort of dream, which was quite agreeable. The humming of the bees and the blossoms mingled with the chanting voice, and drowsily melted into a doze. Dickens sat cross-legged, with his rabbit asleep on his arm, and a hand resting on the lamb's back. Soot had pushed away a squirrel and huddled close to him on his shoulder. The grey film dropped over his eyes. At last Colin stopped. Now I am going to walk around the garden, he announced. Ben Weatherstaff's head had just dropped forward, and he lifted it with a jerk. You have been asleep, said Colin. Now to the sort, mumbled Ben. The sermon was good to know, but I'm bound to get out a the collection. He was not quite awake yet. You're not in church, said Colin. Not me, said Ben, straightening himself. Who said I were? I heard every bit of it. You said the magic was in my back. The doctor calls it rheumatics. The Raja waved his hand. That was the wrong magic, he said. You will get better. You have my permission to go to your work. But come back tomorrow. I'd like to see thee walk round the garden, grunted Ben. It was not an unfriendly grunt, but it was a grunt. In fact, being a stubborn old party, and not having entire faith in magic, he had made up his mind that if he were sent away, he would climb his ladder and look over the wall, so that he might be ready to hobble back, if there were any stumbling. The Raja did not object to his staying, and so the procession was formed. It really did look like a procession. Colin was at its head, with Dickon on one side and Mary on the other. Ben Weatherstaff walked behind, and the creatures trailed after them. The lamb and the fox cub keeping close to Dickon, the white rabbit hopping along or stopping to nibble, and Soot following with the solemnity of a person who felt himself in charge. It was a procession which moved slowly, but with dignity. 
Every few yards it stopped to rest. Colin leaned on Dickens' arm, and privately Ben Weatherstaff kept a sharp lookout. But now and then Colin took his hand from its support and walked a few steps alone. His head was held up all the time, and he looked very grand. The magic is in me, he kept saying. The magic is making me strong. I can feel it. I can feel it. It seemed very certain that something was upholding and uplifting him. He sat on the seats in the alcoves, and once or twice he sat down on the grass, and several times he paused in the path and leaned on Dickon. But he would not give up until he had gone all round the garden. When he returned to the canopy tree, his cheeks were flushed and he looked triumphant. I did it. The magic worked, he cried. That is my first scientific discovery. What will Dr. Craven say? broke out Mary. He won't say anything, Colin answered, because he will not be told. This is to be the biggest secret of all. No one is to know anything about it until I have grown so strong that I can walk and run like any other boy. I shall come here every day in my chair, and I shall be taken back in it. I won't have people whispering and asking questions, and I won't let my father hear about it until the experiment has quite succeeded. Then, sometime, when he comes back to Misselthwaite, I shall just walk into his study and say, Here I am. I am like any other boy. I am quite well, and I shall live to be a man. It has been done by a scientific experiment. He will think he is in a dream, cried Mary. He won't believe his eyes. Colin flushed triumphantly. He had made himself believe that he was going to get well, which was really more than half the battle, if he had been aware of it. And the thought which stimulated him more than any other was this imagining what his father would look like when he saw that he had a son who was as straight and strong as other father's sons. One of his darkest miseries in the unhealthy morbid past days had been his hatred of being a sickly weak-backed boy whose father was afraid to look at him. He'll be obliged to believe them, he said. One of the things I'm going to do after the magic works and before I begin to make scientific discoveries is to be an athlete. We shall have thee taken to boxen in a week or so, said Ben Weatherstaff. Thou end with winning the belt and being champion prizefighter of all England. Colin fixed his eyes on him sternly. Weatherstaff, he said, that is disrespectful. You must not take liberties because you are in the secret. However much the magic works, I shall not be a prize fighter. I shall be a scientific discoverer. Ex pardon, ex pardon, sir, answered Ben, touching his forehead in salute. I ought to have seen it wasn't a joking matter. But his eyes twinkled, and secretly he was immensely pleased. He really did not mind being snubbed, since the snubbing meant that the lad was gaining strength and spirit.